When people refer to modernism, they generally do not mean rock and roll, much less top ten lists. Rock music, clickbait, and the Roman Catholic Church seem like an impossible combination. In the last few decades though, multiple popes have made overtures towards modern stylings such as rock music. Top ten lists though? Well, it gets complicated there. In February 2010, news outlets suddenly started reporting that the Pope, then Benedict XVI, had published a Top 10 Rock Albums of All Time list. An unlikely event because Benedict's preference for classical music, and Gregorian chants, was well documented. What happened was non Italian, or technically non Latin, news outlets misunderstanding a complicated element of Italian Vatican politics. It involved the Vatican press. What happened was a major Vatican newspaper released the list. While not the Pope, or Pope Emeritus, himself, the list was still a Vatican list in technical terms, as it came from within the Vatican walls. The La Zorvatore Romano is referred to as the Pope's paper, but it has a complicated relationship with the papacy itself. The non-Italian press jumped to the conclusion that the Pope was the one endorsing rock music for some reason. He was not, though the church has been open to it for the last few decades outside of a mass setting. The popes have met with Bono and Bob Dylan after all. Still, the question, why did a Vatican newspaper release a top 10 list on rock music? Not to imply the Vatican or the Pope is forbidden from opining on rock and roll. For most observers though, the formalism of the Catholic Church clashes with something as brash as rock and roll. All the popes of the 20th and 21st century have often made their displeasure known at injecting electric guitars into Catholic worship. Benedict's love for Bach is well attested though, and he put a hard line that the Catholic Mass should not veer from sacred polyphonic choral music. Outside worship, rock music is in no way forbidden in the Vatican, like some seem to assume for some reason. This created confusion when the February 14th, 2010 issue of the La Zorvatore Romano was released inside the Leonine Wall. The Desert Island List, as it described itself, raised some eyebrows as it featured a wide variety of artists, from mainstays such as the Beatles and Pink Floyd, to as diverse choices as Michael Jackson and Oasis, the obligatory Catholic inclusion of U2, and picks as left field as Donald Fagan, David Crosby, and a few others all included in the relatively brief Catholic paper. Poor reporting and circular of citations led to a public misunderstanding that it was a official church list. It was not. It was more like a list of cultural observation from the perspective of semi-Vatican insiders. So Catholic in commentary, but in no way official. The misunderstanding is understandable when one examines the status of the La Sorvatore and the complicated structure of Vatican City, the paper, printed daily in Italian, is a newspaper which exists under the oversight of the papacy, but enjoys autonomy as a press organ of Vatican City. The La Sorvatore Romano is privileged with a semi-official status in church public relations that really has no other parallel inside or outside the Catholic Church. The basic explanation, as said, is it is the Pope's paper, but that is a heavy simplification that ignores most of the nuance. It probably did not help the original article by Giuseppe Fiorentino and Gaetano Vellini was in Italian. The English-speaking press is known for wandering confusion about complexities in foreign languages like this. By February 15, 2010, articles in the Anglophone world were citing one another about the funny little event under the misassumption maybe on purpose, that the Pope had made his opinion known on rock and roll. They got the list correct, but all these circular citations in English obscured the origin of the list and its purpose. The original English language article, which all the other articles seem to cite, comes from the Wall Street Journal, written by Chiara Vasari on February 15, 2010. Most other articles about the list simply derive their information from this one, as it seems to have been the first English translation. Truthfully, the list was indirectly the result of the paper's then-editor-in-chief, Giovanni Maria Vian, a professor of philology of ancient Christian literature with deep ties to the Vatican. 
Bian, who is not technically a Vatican official in any legal capacity, but as editor-in-chief of the paper, did initiate increased efforts at a more modern pop-cultural relation. Fiorentino and Vellini, though wrote the top ten list as a semi-serious guide, or a little handbook of musical resistance, to what they called the cheesy and mediocre music of Italian popular festivals that are on TV during the summer. It is somewhat hard to find the actual original list though. It appears to have been pulled from the La Zervatore Romano's website. All the original links in the articles referring to it are dead. Not that the Italian website is easy to navigate. It looks like it's still in 2010. So a native speaker will have better luck finding it. There is a copy of it though, on Gaetano Vellini's blog, Camera Con Vista, where it is titled 10 Records to Survive Festivals, with the subheading Semi-Serious Handbook of Musical Resistance. All in Italian, of course. So why was the list pulled then, or even included to begin with? It goes with the paper's history. The La Zorvatore was founded as the mouthpiece paper of the Holy See. Its foundation in the 1800s was predated by several earlier Catholic newspapers located in and around Rome. The Il Constitutionale Romano, started printing in 1848, ceased production, re-emerged under the name La Zorvatore Romano in 1849, but then stopped publication again in 1852 due to unrest in Italy. It was definitively refounded in Rome in 1861, under the current modern name, with the approval and support of Pope Pius IX. The close ties were due both to the Holy See's close support of the paper at its founding, and the political purpose for it. The modern paper was funded as a pro-papacy paper in contrast to the rising tide of Italian nationalism in Italy at the time, as Italian unification was commencing. The Catholic loyalist Italians and French Catholic intellectuals who founded the paper intended it as a counterweight to the anti-clerical newspapers across Europe, which were highly critical of the Catholic Church at the time. The main intention of the paper was to argue the case of the territorial integrity of the then-existent Papal States against the Italian unification or Risorgimento. The paper would outgrow this purpose though by the 1870s, when the Kingdom of Italy acquired the city of Rome but the paper would continue on as a political and religious daily paper in service of the Catholic Church. Its concern, by the end of the 1800s, was to argue the case of the Pope in the Roman question, as it was called at the time, the unclear legal status of the Pope in Rome, or as a prisoner in the Vatican. This close relationship was solidified outright in 1890, when Pope Leo bought the paper. Its role as the public political press organ of the Pope would increase afterwards. The paper declared, as the mouthpiece of the Catholic Church in 1923, the Pope must not only have the reality of liberty, but the undeniable evidence of an absolute liberty and independence from any power, a statement which colored the Church and the paper throughout the early 1900s. The Losovatore would have a temperamental and whiplash relationship with the Italian political realities that followed. The most notorious was a brief honeymoon period with Mussolini's government in the 1920s. The brief warming between the Italian states, fascist at the time, and Catholic Church was mainly due to the support of universal Catholic education early on in fascist Italy, and organizing the Lateran Treaty, part of the Lateran Pax of 1929. The treaty between the Italian king, Victor Emmanuel III, and Pope Pius XI officially settled the Roman question in 1929, as the Holy See was officially recognized as an independent state in the form of Vatican City. Though, these warm relationships would soon dissolve due to censorship and intimidation placed on the Lo Zervatore as it grew critical of the fascist government. Ironically, Prime Minister Mussolini's cultivation of the Lateran Treaty would be his undoing later on with the paper. As Vatican City was now an independent nation, Pope Pius XI moved the La Zervatore into the city at the Via del Pellegrino, where it remains today. Now free of Italy and Italian law, the La Zervatore began to turn on Mussolini after staying their tongue and as Mussolini's unofficial censorship increased. It was the only paper that could openly print criticism of the fascist government at the time due to the Pope's protection and the fact it wasn't technically in Italy. Even during the occupation of Rome in 1943 and 1944, the Lazzaro Torre continued to print. Giovanni Battista Montini, later Pope Paul VI, would write on the era, 
during the sad and dramatic period of the Last World War, when the Italian press was gagged through harsh censorship and stuffed with propaganda, La Zovatore played a marvelous role at the time, not because it took advantage of the situation to branch out into new activities, but because it continued undaunted in its capacity as a free and honest provider of information. As the paper of Vatican City, La Zovatore, comes from an obviously Catholic perspective, Pope Paul VI would go on to call it not a paper of news, but one of ideas or as it describes itself today, a political religious newspaper, sometimes political moral newspaper. Its modern intention is the reliable, authoritative presentation of the Pope's teaching, the publication of the Acts and Documents of the Holy See, and the theological comments and study of timely issues the Church is facing today. Its role in the Church is only outranked by the Latin Acta Postalice Sedis, which is the direct promulgated Acts and Declarations from the Pope himself. The Pope does occasionally publish in the La Sorvitore, though. This does not restrict the paper from interacting politically or culturally with the wider world. Sections of it are occasionally dedicated to cultural observation and such. An occasional feature which started all the way back in 1909 with remarks on art, sports, and theater of the time. In recent years, this has increased. When then editor in chief Giovanni Maria Vian was appointed by Pope Benedict XVI on October 27, 2007, Vian was interested in opening up the paper to the world in this respect. Modern authorities have described the paper as the press of the Vatican milieu. Not Vatican officials, but the semi-official rumor mill of the Vatican itself. In Italian, the paper is called Ufficioso, which clarifies its complicated status. Ufficioso is hard to translate into English in this context. It essentially means reliable but not official news which comes from the sources close to the authority. It monitors the mood of the Vatican. While localized to Vatican City, the La Zovatore is considered the paper of the Catholic Church by most governments, but it is technically not. The descriptor, the Pope's paper, is correct, but misleading. It is not as direct as the Acta Apostolice Sedis, but it is close. Pope Francis says he reads two newspapers, Rome's Il Messaggero and La Zovatore Romano. So what did Fiorentino in Vellini's list actually say? It's honestly not particularly unique, largely the fare you would find on a classic rock station. What makes it fascinating is it was published by papers so closely associated with the Vatican. So how do the choices stack up? Well, I'll let you have your opinion. As noted, this list was not ranked by the writers, it only features each album to recommend. The list is not organized to rank the albums in any order. It opens with the Beatles' 1966 classic of rock and roll, the album Revolver, obligatory for any list on rock music, one can assume, though the choice of seen milk toast for some rock critics. The article from the paper argues it is the Beatles' strongest album. Special praise goes to the album's simplicity and sound density. Next comes David Crosby's 1971 album, If I Could Only Remember My Name. It seems to be a personal favorite of either Fiorentino or Vellini. The article praises Crosby for his musical experimentation, and this album's intent to build up, in contrast to the rebellion of the rest of the Woodstock generation. The two then follow that up with Pink Floyd's 1973 The Dark Side of the Moon, another obligatory choice like Revolver, but the prog rock nature, combined with psychedelics, may surprise some people for the openness. The commentary name drops Pink Floyd's fourth album, Umaguma, but says Dark Side is more like sushi while Umaguma is a perfectly cooked carbonara. Fleetwood Mac's 1977 Rumors. It's Fleetwood Mac, nothing more to say on that. The writer's next choice is a niche record which never achieved real commercial success. Donald Fagan's 1982 solo debut album, The Nightfly, one half of the band Steely Dan. It is always good for some jazz and conversation. The list takes note of its metropolitan atmosphere. Wonderful. Michael Jackson's legendary 1982 album, Thriller. Interesting inclusion for a lot of reasons, but some people may have a lot of objections to including it. One, because they may not consider it purely rock, but I don't think this list is pure rock by this point. The article does not shy away from remarking on both the album and Jackson's eccentricity in personality and sound. The semi-folk rock resumes with another surprising choice with Paul Simon's 1986 endeavor, Graceland. Not a bad album by any means, but it seems to break the pattern the rest of the list is going for, included because it 
marks the birth of world music, according to the writers. The obligatory Irish choice, it is the Catholic Church after all, comes with U2's 1991 Actung Baby, another milestone in rock music, an album the list praises as one of very high musical and textual content, a special nod given to Bono and U2's social commentary and social commitment. The next swerve of the list comes with Oasis's What's the Story, Morning Glory from 1995. While a blowout upon release, reception on it has cooled over the years. So seeing something like it on the list is an interesting choice. Maybe it has something to do with the composition, the saturated guitars on the album are praised. The final album is Carlos Santana's Supernatural from 1999, which closes off the list. Hey, when it comes to guitar, not many can beat Carlos Santana. The writers have a clear soft spot for strong or accentuated guitar spots. A noticeable exclusion on the list is Bob Dylan, whatever your opinion on Bob Dylan is. Made even more surprising because the Vatican has hosted Bob Dylan before. The list actually acknowledges this with the notice on Dylan that, despite his great poetic vein, he was excluded from the list because, as a singer-songwriter, he paved the way for future unprofessional singer-songwriters who have harshly tested the ears and patience of listeners. Finally, someone says it. Grazie. And amen. Ultimately, the list was something better suited for Vellini's blog, where it now resides. Not the Lazzovatore. The somewhat strange choice in topical publication for the Vatican City paper led to no end of confusion in that case. So no, no Pope has ever endorsed any rock and roll album. Though, Pope Francis has released a prog rock album, also, a top 10 list is in no way Catholic teaching. Not that this list was intended as some official Catholic catechism on rock music. Yet, the music of history, or the press, can bring us to some strange collisions or conclusions. I'd like to give a holy rock and roller thank you to my supporter, the Gel Samini family. Mm -hmm. 